we we started this road to convention with uh, this presentation because we've got quite a few new members and they were asking about the history of the organization. So uh, Tom and I put together a history of Kansas Farmers Union for our centennial back in 2007. And really, we haven't shown that slideshow publicly since then. So this is a nice time to dust it off and update it a little and and just kind of go through the history of Kansas Farmers Union, which also reflects a lot of the history of National Farmers Union. Anyhow, this is our logo from our centennial. And uh, we presented it in 2007 at the centennial. Emil Mushrush and Gene Lorison helped a lot with some of the history. Uh, starting out, of course, National Farmers Union was formed at Point, Texas in 1902. And then in 1905 is our first meeting in Kansas. So, Tom, it's your turn. Well, yeah, I'm just going to back up a little bit about Farmers Union in 1902. You know, we actually were the rebirth of the old Farmers Alliance and Industrial Union, which started in the 1880s. And it, it went along for quite a few years and fell apart during the time of, um, of when the People's Party came into play. They got kind of absorbed by the Populist Party and fell apart. So really what Farmers Union was, was the resurrection of the old uh, Farmers Alliance. And a lot of those organizers, a lot of those people weren't ready to give up. And like that group of prior that was in Kansas on a prior slide <clears throat> were some of those people. So... It started in it started in East Texas, and we weren't a national organization to begin with. We were a Texas organization. It wasn't until 1906 that we really went national. But we started with cotton, and our growth of the organization was big in Texas and and uh, and in Arkansas and and Louisiana, so on and so forth. But it spread east into Florida. Then by 1913, it got up. Our biggest membership state was North Carolina, of all things. So it was cotton country, but just to take it just a little bit farther, <clears throat> about 1914, 15 is when it moved into the plain state, plain states, and it really faded in the South. And there was some reasons because of World War One and the cotton thing. Um, I'm kind of going off on a tangent here, but it really not. I want to see why we faded out in the South. We were huge in the export and cotton. We had offices in Liverpool. Uh, in in uh, Nashville, but the Germans started sinking our boats that were carrying our cotton over to Europe, and a lot of our members lost a lot of money in the South because we had no way to make that up to them, and that was the reason one of the reasons why Farmers Union died out in the South. But then cooperatives in the Midwest is what was a real rebirth. We've had we just have continual rebirth. So anyway, 1905. We the, the organizers came up into southeast Kansas, and this was this was an actual photograph of where the first Farmers Union local meeting was held in Kansas in Cherokee County. Our organization, uh, we actually had an organizational meeting in 1905, but that didn't go so well because Charlie Barrett, our national president, came out, and back then the board members were not state presidents. They were elected at large. And we had a guy from Kansas that was on the national board. I don't know how he pulled that off, but he got crossways with the national organization. And when when uh, Barrett came up to present our charter in the Hutchison meeting, he was laying, laying for Barrett and he had the sheriff come in and serve papers on Charlie Barrett, which essentially is why we didn't get a charter the first time. When you have when you serve papers on the national president at your organizational meeting, it doesn't go over real well. So anyway, little side story. All right, that's all I can do here. Can you listen to it? I'm listening. What else? Uh, the first K Kansas president was McQuillan from right next door to me, the next county over. <clears throat> he he was an organ early organizer too, but uh, he didn't stick around very long. There's on the left is his picture. And then on the right was our vice president, Paris Henderson. Paris Henderson, by the way, moved out to California and started the California Farmers Union about 1908. In 
never got our official charter. This Hewins only served a year or two. Um, was Dover, Kansas in Northeast Kansas. He was just kind of one of these, and Farmers Union's had this history of, we put people in place in leadership, be it national or state organizations, and just to get it going, and then they get rolled out or they, they bow out. But very rarely do you see one of the early, one of the organized leaders with much longevity in the organization. And this is the Kansas board. Um, I could name, when I think our next slide has all the names, it really is immaterial, but these guys came from all over the state. <clears throat> it was interesting wherever the organization started, like out in Hodgman County, a couple three is Hodgman Ford County, which is west of me. Um, <clears throat> down by Medicine Lodge uh, was another hot spot, and of course Northeast Kansas. And this this picture was the front page of the very first Farmers Union newspaper. Yeah, and that's another side note. I'll just quick briefly mention too about newspapers and farm organizations. That that's what it was all about. Most. Most of your pre early presidents, be it national or or state, they edited the newspaper. And newspapers were the money makers for the, a lot of the organizations. They would, when they went around and signed people up, they'd say, you went, we're gonna join Farmers Union, you know, we're gonna work for the farmers. And by the way, we're gonna send you this news, newspaper, either in some cases it was weekly, some bi-weekly, some monthly. Um, so, Newspapers were a big part in the, in the whole printing process. So yeah, th but this was, we decided to have our own newspaper within our organization. And, and this was a photo on the initial uh, edition. Yeah, and if anybody has any statements to make or questions to ask, you know, enter them in the chat room and, and Mercedes will relay them. We usually are used to talking to a live audience and have some two-way back and forth. That's just the names of the yeah. people in the picture. And you know, if you and don't go back to it, but that national picture of the national board, which everybody's seen over the years, nine of those ten, they said that was the ten founders, but actually one of those guys wasn't. He was set. He was sitting in for somebody uh, that couldn't be there. So it's. Anyway, I always say it's nine guys and a dentist because that was the guy that filled in for him. So nine farmers and a dentist. Our first state office was in Kingman, Kansas, briefly. Uh, then we went to Topeka and we were spent quite a bit of year, quite a few years in Topeka and Salina was the and nationally, our organization was always the national office was located whatever state the state president was from. It moved with the state president. In the early days, Denver was our first permanent home. Uh oh. Uh oh, what? He wasn't letting me. Oh. So I got to figure out where we're at. I think we can go on by that. That's just where our state office. And then, okay, in the early part, uh, you know, we're very fraternal in nature. And Farm organizations, there were a slug of them. And I have a book that uh, it's one of a series of, of an encyclopedia. It's a farm org. And this is a, a book of all the farm organizations through about 1981. And there were just tons of them. And there was a lot of, a lot of um, small organizations that would come up and they have a lot of energy and then they'd phase out and die. But <clears throat> what's really interesting, I think, is the only three general farm organizations left are Farmers Union, of course, Farm Bureau, and the Grange to some degree, which is really rare. And what's really caused that phenomenon to happen and that, we, that we've seen the demise of, of so many organizations was actually the, the checkoffs and the, the individual commodity organizations like the wheat growers, the corn growers, the cattlemen association, and it's always been difficult to collect dues as a general farm organization, but basically they do it through che checkoffs on the commodity. So that I think it says uh, speaks volumes about, especially farmers union that that we're around and there's a reason we're around. And, um, and I think we're, we're really a special organization. 
our early constitution and bylaws, <clears throat> well, you know, we had a ritual in these little pocketbooks and that was something else, another way they made money. People would, would carry these literally in their pocket. And in the early part of the century, that century, fraternal organizations were a big thing. I mean, in every community and not just farm organizations. <clears throat> but these rituals were kind of, they're fascinating reading because they were, you weren't supposed to let this out of your possession, but within there, there'll be all of these challenge signs, recognition signs, these secret signals, like you'd tug on your collar, uh, a secret handshake, a certain amount of door wraps on a, went to get in a, to a meeting. Initiation ceremony is, which I'd really like to do at national a national convention sometime is reenact a, a ritual, which has a lot of meaning about what well, gets into monopolies and their control of people and so on and so forth. And then also in here, they had burial ceremonies to where when a farmer's union member died, you lined up, they had a special service and, and the way you line up at the funeral and the way you go out to the gravesite. And uh, so it was very fraternal, but that kept some people from joining because they did, especially there was some people got crossways with religious organizations, the Catholic church, and I'm Catholic, so I can say this, but they got, they had a little bit of an issue with this. And that's why, <clears throat> I guess it's competition, but that's why about World War I time, we went from the ritual to a manual and then the manual was um, how we operated with cooperatives and kind of take us into the business aspect. The ritual also went through the whole thing about initiations and, and uh, secret hand grips. And, and the way they wanted to collect dues, you paid dues quarterly and they gave you a new password to get in the meeting. You had to have the password to get in the meeting. I'm probably getting ahead of ourselves a little bit here. And they changed that quarterly and they were really strict about that. In fact, uh, Charlie Barrett, who was president from 1907 uh, to 1928, he was wanted to go to a local meeting one time, and he didn't know the password, and they wouldn't let him in, national president. <laughs> so anyway, so that's the story on the rituals and the and the manuals, and and you know we don't we you had to put yourself in that very early organization how they would organize in locals. It was around the schoolhouse principle because people didn't travel. We didn't have roads. We very few automobiles. So you went to the local schoolhouse. That was a social center. And um, um, there's some of that stuff I got into a little bit more. But, but um, there was a lot to be said about the way they would meet and uh, how they'd conduct their meetings. I think we can go to the next slide, maybe, Don. Yeah, there's the dues early on where uh, the organizers, when they organized a, a local, which was a subunit within a county, because there were so many people, you had to have 15 members. And these organizers, the the initiation fee, they would get to keep half of that or a little bit more. And the other half was divided between national, state, and a charter fee to the state. And um, um, the annual dues, like I say, that's how, that's how they made a living. But these guys made, some of these guys would sign up people for the right reasons. Others would rent it for the money because they could sign up 15 people and they made $13, which was a lot of money in those days. And some of them would try to build it even bigger, but then next they just started a new local going down the road. The old saying was on, uh, on these organizers that they said doing well by doing good. In other words, they were getting pretty wealthy by doing this. So uh, membership in the early days, there was restrictions. Uh, at the meetings, you couldn't speak of any topic on religion or, or partisan politics. And that's what really tore the, tore the organization, uh, Farmers Alliance apart. In fact, North Dakota Farmers Union, you know, it actually started in 1915, but by the nonpartisan league got going up there and Gladys Talbert Edwards, an ed director from up there, which she was a daughter of Charlie Talbot, a great organizer up there, said that it got so bad at the local meetings, people talking politics, she said that neighbor refused to talk to neighbor and it just blew everything up. So that's the reason they had this in there. Let's go on, Don. Kind of like today. 
Yeah, it really is. The it's irony of this, though, is the next slide says you have to believe in a supreme being to be a member. <laughs> so. well, and we were <clears throat> in the South, we were segregated uh, because you look, it says a white person or an Indian of industrious habits. And the reason that's in there, Oklahoma wasn't state yet. So Oklahoma was Indiahoma and Oklahoma wasn't statehood. But these organizers wanted to go in and sign these people up, but they couldn't sign the, the natives up, the Native Americans, because they weren't, quote, white. So they made that, that um, uh, exception so you could have, have that happen. The North really ignored all that. In fact, I've got to research this some more. Now, we never got rid of it out of our, out of our Constitution until 1932 or 33 about, uh, about minorities being members. But in 1921, we sent a black delegate from Kansas to the National Convention as a delegate. It caused, it caused quite a stir, but that really was, Kansas can be pretty proud that, that we, we really initiated that. And in here, you, 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 if you're a lawyer, you could be a member, banker, grain trader. They had some good parts. <laughs> yeah. But then they'd let school teachers in, physicians, ministers of the gospel. And by the way, a lot of the state presidents and even national presidents were ministers. And it's because they could talk. You know, they, they had the skill set to get up and give a talk. Yeah. And then if an editor of a newspaper, and the newspapers are so important, but you could be a member, but if you ever wanted to badmouth Farmers Union, you had to withdraw from the organization quietly and not say anything back. You had to take an oath. Okay, the officer structure in the very early days, president, vice president, secretary, treasurer, obviously the lecturer, these are the people that went around and got people pumped up to attend meetings. It, and that's how they built membership a lot. They'd send a lecturer out first. Doorkeepers, obvious, you know, you had to have the password to get in. The conductor was, was someone who prepared the meeting. I mean, if you were, uh, if you, somebody had to go light the coal stove, draw some water, do all these things. I'd say the modern day conductor is like Mercedes. She's the one that gets the Zoom meeting lined out. So we'll, we'll call her the conductor tonight. There you go. Somewhere we got them listed out, but it must be far. Yeah, and we might we might run on to it, but I just kind of ramble here. Sorry. And that yeah. charter, yeah, back then five units to make a charter, and I have in my possession, and they'll go to the archives someday, a list of, of some minute books of a of a local in um, McPherson or Saline County. I don't know which it would be. And it was a Smoky Hill local. And it, from the very first meeting, it gives the whole story of how that local started. And I've got the minute books up until the 1940s or end of the 50s, actually. And it's interesting to watch that because they formed their co-ops locally. And that, from that local really has some of the tap roots of the farmland industry, farmland industries. But it's, a, it's an interesting way to understand how uh, farmers union organizations function then and still function today and we'll get into them parallels a little bit later but we don't deal with locals now but locals were local communities or is they focused around a school district or a church yeah right and there's a i actually have that charter that came up up here at lacrosse and that that's was in 1913 so that's over it's like 107 years ago and that's what they had issued to you when you got enough members to have a local. There I talk about the doorkeeper, won't let you in or out. Um, the deliberations, okay. Conductor, that's Mercedes. So she's the one that lights the candles, has the seances. Um, locals, and by, well, I should let you talk a little bit, Don, go ahead. No, I just, you know, they just took off growing like crazy. And so, yeah. You know, in, in a year where they had 8,000 members, and by 1954, the last charter we can find is 2,288. Now, in the last couple of years, we've chartered a couple of new charters, which we're real proud of, but they're not numbered in the sequence with what was done back then. In those sequence, they even if those, char those locals died out, you still went on with that next sequence. 
And about that kind of way away in the 70s, because we rechartered all of our counties in the early 70s. Okay, we're going to jump on to some uh, women involvement within the organization very early on. And this woman was a school teacher, Miss Amanda Bates, up in Rooks County, North Central Kansas. And she was the first female president of a local that's, that was in the United States, of a local farmers union unit. So <clears throat> very progressive farmers union was, you know, we, we supported women's suffrage. Women have played a, a huge role, always have in farmers union. That started, Minning Lovinger in South Dakota was really our first ed director. And that was in the, oh, pre-World War I. And of course it grew from there. And, you know, we have people like Gladys Talbert Edwards on, in education, youth education. And people that worked in the legislative arena like Ruth Cobell, who's still alive. She's a, she'll be 102 on Halloween day. And I, I haven't talked to her this year but I had some wonderful visits with her. But one thing I did discover from, from Ruth was that one of the things that really kicked the door open for women in Farmers Union, it was progressive as we were, we still weren't good enough, was World War II. Because a lot of the young men went off to the war and these women filled a role of, in leadership in the county at all, all levels. And that just opened the door and, and brought on so much depth and so much richness to our organization. So it's it's kind of a kind of a strange twist how things happen, but we we we've, uh, we've done really well there. I think one of our early president. Oh, go ahead, Don. I was just going to say in this slideshow we list every state president we've had. We'll try and get through them pretty quick. <laughs> Real quick. But this guy was Morris McCullough was a little Irishman that really got us going. He used his own money. To, to keep Farmers Union going. Um, he was a real real fireball and he grew the organizations to over 120,000 members in Kansas. And he was on the national board, different, different things. So, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, by 1920, 100 men and women wore the Kansas Farmers Union in Sigma. 120,000. Yeah. 120,000, excuse me. I mean, it, it's that growth, you know, I was talked about how it went along the South and then up North Carolina and then in the Plain State. That was all about cooperatives. And we'll get to that just a little bit. But, but um, oh boy, what was I going to say about that whole cooperative thing? Uh, well, it'll come back to me. Um, Don, so, you can talk about the wheat pool. Yeah, I just, uh, this. This was all farm stored grain. This isn't like it was held in elevators. And so, you know, one of the reports that we read about this working successfully is that uh, they were so proud that not a single farmer to their knowledge broke the pool before they got the price they were asking for. And so it worked. And it just scared the crap out of the federal government. Yeah. And, and, you know, the, Canadian wheat pool survived until this past decade, and that did really good things for the Canadian wheat farmer or the Canadian wheat farmer. And early farm programs, you know, we think of the AAA program in the 30s, which is true, but before that, there was a McNary Hagan, and it passed Congress several times, but it was always vetoed. But part of that was a function where, of course, we had formed so many co ops, especially in the Midwest, in the, right after World War I and during World War I. Like I think Kansas did five or 600 just in one year. But we had these local cooperatives formed and then we started forming the, the regional cooperatives. And there was always this argument about what we should do. Well, they came up and they said, well, we need to do both. But that's originally in the late twenties when they started to pool this grain, they, they had a pool of $500 million to make this all work. And then of course the stock market crash, everything went to pot. And that's really kind of how it fell apart. But they were federating the co-ops and wheat marketing was going to all be done through cooperatives. In fact, there was another time a little bit later that Farmers Union actually successfully got the Board of Trade shut down because they wouldn't allow us a seat on the Board of Trade to trade grain. And they got shut down until we can get on. Don, I'll let you talk a little bit. Okay. Uh... In 1914, 
37 farmers met and bought a share of stock in a new venture called Kansas Farmers Union Jobbing Association. Um, based in Kansas City, uh, grew to be the largest grain handler in the United States as in farmland industries. And from humble beginnings, the Kansas Farmers Union Jobbing Association handled 39 Oh, hey. I have some questions for you. Yeah. Um, uh, Saturday. Mm -hmm. Rosanna, mute. There you go. Uh, anyhow, uh, from in 1960, they handled 39 million bushels of grain. So uh, the side story to all of this is we all know that farmland industries took bankruptcy in 2002. But what was important for the history of farmland industries was there was two employees that realized the importance and value of the history of farmland industries and they had orders to ship everything out to the landfill and they set aside some boxes they thought significant and called kansas state university and said, if you want these records, be here by noon with a pickup, otherwise they're going to be in the landfill. And they went over there and got that. And those documents, that pickup load of documents has been stored at Hale Library at K-State since then. I haven't heard if those records have survived the Hale Library fire or not. I suspect they did because they were storing them off site when I would access them. But I actually, in that pile, is the original minutes book of that initial meeting. And it lists every farmer that was involved in it and, and it lists the whole minutes of that meeting. So that's as direct link as you can get to farmland industries taking bankruptcy and having in their possession the original minutes book from when it was chartered in 1914. And God bless those two guys for saving that information. And it's just a, a treasure trove of history of agriculture in Kansas and central states. Hey, Don. Yeah. Yeah, uh, this is Nick. Um, my great aunt, Donna Roth, who will be 90 years old next summer, uh, she, was, she worked for the Jobbing Association in Salina in their office. So she did all of their clerking and, and everything and, and recorded all of those bushels of grain that were coming into the Salina office. She still tells me to this day that was her favorite job in her whole time of working after she'd gone to school at Brown Mackey and, and that. But uh, we like to visit a lot about Farmers Union. So I just thought I'd throw that in there. But she still says that was her favorite job was doing that. Yeah, working for Farmers Union is running the family. <clears throat> All righty. Uh, anyhow, it was changed to Farmers Union Job and Association, then the CMA and Farmarco, and then became part of the Farmland Industries umbrella. <clears throat> Go ahead. Yeah, one of the significant things that Tom and I found when we were going through the early records was in 1918, it, it went under, it wasn't going to work. And so at the 1918 state convention, delegates came up with an extra $2,000 to capitalize it and keep it going. And John Trumbull had stated this in, in later years that he said that when he reported to the delegates, their experiment into cooperatively working together had failed and that the KFU Job and Association was ending due to the lack of funds, that the room was full of hard bitten farmers crying all over the room. And that these same men who were all broker than the KFU job and association came up with the needed equity out of their own pockets to carry it on. So that did, that just shows you the dedication of the members at that time. But then Tom, you can kind of get into this, but this is all the subsidiary uh, <coughs> associations yeah. that you know, cooperatives, of course, we had all of our local cooperatives, which would be another whole story. But they, they, you know, we think of cooperatives as where we sell a lot of things, but 
back in those days, we would buy things, household appliances, uh, barbed wire, paints, varnishes, all these things that would go on. And, and so, yeah, there was a buying and a selling, you know, the creameries, the, the feed mills, all these things that the twine. Um, and, you know, just briefly, I'll just say that the Farmers Union Jobbing Association Farmland Industries was in the southern part of the basically plains. The northern part was CHS. I mean, it was Sanex Harvest. That was all Farmers Union. Sanex is Farmers Union Central Exchange. And so that that still survives and thrives today, farmland industries went by the by the wayside. Um, yeah. And yeah, and they're, that's the largest cooperative in the nation now. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, we did all these things for our, as member services and did a wonderful job. I like this slide. It shows the co-op seed corn dealers in 1944, but you know, virtually you go through a rural community in Kansas, that elevator was built by those farmers union local members. And like the top, very top one in the top left, the farmers union co-op elevator man in Kansas, well, that would be my own neck. It was a branch of that. So that would have been ours. And you never seen farmers union co-op elevator name anywhere on any of their propaganda, as long as I can ever remember, but that's how they're chartered. And that's how almost all the elevators are chartered. Yeah. And that's how we had membership built off of that because you membership was built off of that. And then of course, Farm Bureau come into play and they're the ones that really kind of move that out. And if you look around my neck of the woods anyway, they farmers union co-op, a lot of times they took the union out just called the farmers co-op or like or Roselle, it's a union co-op, but they drop half of the name to appease some of the people that that didn't um, like Farmers Union, but it was huge. And that, and we'll talk a little bit about that seed corn thing a little bit later. Yo, you got to talk about here a minute. I got to go get my pencil. Okay, Livestock Association and commissions nationwide. I mean, Kansas, we had, in Kansas, we had um, uh, one at Parsons, one at Wichita, but nationwide, uh, we had uh, stockyards in St. Joe's, Missouri, Omaha, Kansas City, Denver, all over the Midwest, and Farmers Union was mar was in charge or was established to to create live markets for, and that did away with a lot of the Packer stuff because we we were able to to have price discovery in our markets, and, and thanks to Farmers Union and these livestock commissions, and uh, they were they were huge and did a wonderful thing. And if you're a Farmers Union member, of course, you got patronage out of that. If you weren't, you didn't. So it was really attractive to be a Farmers Union member because you really got fantastic paybacks from this thing, plus market discovery. So see if I can get this right. Oh, yeah. Found this in dad's paraphernalia a while back. And so it's the Farmers Union Livestock Exchange, St. Joseph, Missouri. And so... Dad never knew I was involved in Farmers Union, but he was a member in marketing to the St. Joe Livestock Association. I figured I'd like to get a hold of that pencil. Yeah, if you ever want to get a long story about these marketing associations, just ask John Hanson. He'll talk. He'll tell how they started the truck and drove all the way with his dad. Anyway, it's, I just kind of poking at John, kind of fun there, but but it was huge, huge part of the organization. Let's go on to the next slide. Now, and maybe the next one. Creameries were a big thing, you know, and people would um, would still milk. And we had, our creamery operation was so huge that we actually owned our own refrigerated rail cars and we shipped butter and cream and products to the East Coast, mostly New York. And read the last bullet point, the uh, live animals. Yeah. And live animals. I mean, we were into this thing huge. And somewhere I've got a photograph of they were yellow and green, had the Farmers Union emblem on the side on the rail cars. Just fascinating. Um, yeah, just Joaquini Creamery. Uh, I, 
I might mention the last bullet point uh, that booklet that had that information and is actually in that information to Hell Library at K State. And so I got that directly from those early records and minutes that in 1926, Kansas had $55 million of property insurance issued. And the next largest farmers union state was 1 million. So that's, they were juggernauts in it. Yeah, our insurance, I, insurances are an interesting thing nationally and, and statewide. I, that's another whole topic for another whole day. Farmers union banks, you know, it, what they were were cooperative banks. And we fought tooth and nail to get that passed through the Kansas legislature. There were other states in you know, farmers union states that had Mississippi, some of them in the South had, had banks. But we started in 1924 at the Kansas City Bank. First day we had 35,000 in deposits. Um, by 1928, we had about 10 farmers union banks in Kansas. But one, uh, the one in Kansas City made a couple of really bad loans. And um, when it started to domino out, it was bad. But during that year, also this was in April when, ours, when our bank had its problem. But in already in April of 28, it said we should not, in the papers they talk about, we should not feel bad because there was over 70 banks um, just in Kansas but for the year, there was 158 banks that failed in Kansas. So that that was just a fan, that was an interesting time. And uh, Lawrence had one. Uh, they were they were around the state. Ulysses, uh, Farmers Union. We had all our we're always big in cooperatives. That's one of the common threads. We had all these subsidiary cooperatives that helped our local cooperatives. Um, you know the Creamery uh, statewide, uh, livestock of course, or insurance. But we had an auditing association for our local elevators. We had a royalty company. We had manager association, all these functions. And it was highly organized, highly structured, and very successful. That royalty company, that was oil speculation. Yeah. So it was like, rather than you make it and your neighbor not make it, let's make it together. And I still get calls from attorneys to this day, settling estates, wanting to know if that royalty company had any value anymore. Oklahoma's is still active and they do a, a yearly report at their annual meeting to their royalty company where they've done cooperatively speculating. Tom just said, we shot dry holes, they didn't. <laughs> yeah, we, our first one was around Lindsburg. Okay. Just as a personal thing, this photo, these guys were recognized for being early pioneers in the Kansas Farmers Union. The second one from the left, as you look at that, is my great uncle. And he joined in 1908. So I can trace my family. I'm my, I don't know. I think my grandpa, I really don't know about him. I think he stayed home and drank beer and had kids with his wife because my mom was one of 16 kids. And I don't know how active he was in Farmer Union, but this guy, Alloy Spearser, was very, very active. But yeah, so I can trace, I can literally trace my family back to 1908 in Farmer Union. There you go. Um, yeah. <clears throat> it just okay. talks about it shifting from fraternal to yeah. business economic. Uh, I just love the information on the paper. I mean, 42,000 by 1920, a weekly distribution. Hey, yeah. And I've got all these papers on microfilm and I've read, read them all pretty much once. And I need to go back. Talk, yeah. And then the ads in these paper were kind of hilarious. There were people just like today, I mean, looking for a wife or some, some woman would put an ad in there. Go to the next slide and medical assistance you get your piles cured without the knife so anyway but going back to that fraternal thing i just want to quick briefly mention you know barrett and these are common threads that run through the organization still today and some of these quotes from these early guys are still ring true but barrett was the president from 06 to 28 one of his quotes was we make better neighbors when we get together and that was true then. It was true in 1940s. 
50s, 60s, and still true today. Dornblazer, another early organizer, one of his quotes was, you can't help yourself without helping the other fellow, which I think he was the 11th man to join Farmers Union. And I'm just going to randomly throw these three quotes in before I, our time gets away on us. But S.O. Dawes, who was the India Homa Farmers Union president in 1905, one of his quotes that I really liked, he was an old Alliance guy. <clears throat> he said, quote, we must go together and stand by each other for better or worse. If we do it, we'll win. If we don't, we'll lose. So they had the spirit. Like, I think we still have the spirit. Now, <clears throat> this, these, I call them cartoons, but they're, you know, graphics that were real common in the 30s and 40s. This John Bayer did moldables for a farmer's union. And then this is how they illustrated how, what the importance of farmer's union was to be organized. You know, farmer's union, we think of the triangle with cooperation, legislation with education at the base. But in the early days, it, legislation wasn't on there. It was across the streaming header on their, all the papers, all the papers was education, cooperation and organization. And I've given a talk on this at one of the national conventions on the value of organization. And it's a fascinating topic when you start to study organization and organizational skills and by God, they had them. So this, this cartoon depicts that. Let's go on to the next one, Don. One <clears throat> of the things pertain to today too. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, okay. 1918, you know, this is World War I and there was a lot of things going on. Of course, a lot of the farm boys volunteered to go to the war because they were anxious to see the world and, and get, out, get out of some work. <clears throat> but what that really did was drained a lot of the farm labor. And about that time is when Henry Ford come in, because, you know, the big tractors are the ones that were around first, the, the humongous ones, but the small tractor. So Farmers Union was a major sponsor of the National Tractor Exposition in Salina in 1918. And this was two square miles of exhibits. Um, and they laid out, I forget how many miles of pipe for steam to, for steam powered organ or stuff. And, and Oliver Plow Company had, 88 representatives there, believe it or not. And then there, we got some ads that kind of slipped through here. So it was, it was interesting, but farm labor at that time, we started going into the machine age and a lot of things started changing within Farmers Union and within our communities then. So one thing about this history I've, I've picked up on, I've learned probably more about sociology and rural communities just by virtue of studying the papers and, and farm organizations. Okay, Don, let's move on. Yeah, one thing that really struck me was how they took advantage of the war effort to kind of push us into the tractor age and yep. made, it a, made it a patriotic thing to do. <clears throat> right. Let's move on. <laughs> okay state commit you know and by the way we in well in january of 19 we didn't have our convention because of the spanish flu and national didn't they had postponed theirs as well that year so it's not unprecedented that a pandemic changes our schedule uh, but don i'll let you go ahead and talk about the early the, during the teens. Okay, I, uh, I'm, I'm always fascinated by this story and I like telling it. So, uh, but in 1916, President Woodrow Wilson came and spoke to our state convention. And uh, the main purpose of his coming was he was trying to get America to prepare to enter World War I and Kansas Farmers Union was adamantly opposed to the war. And it was held in Municipal Auditorium in Topeka, Kansas. It's now the Art uh, Topeka Performing Arts Center. And uh, what was neat when Tom and I was researching it through the records, we were, <coughs> excuse me, we were doing all this research at the Kansas Historical Society. They had all the Farmers Union papers on microfilm. 
but and so we were looking through there and we knew Woodrow Wilson had came but they they barely said anything in the papers about it it was just kind of like during the minutes of the meeting of that convention that yeah the president came and talked to us and then the paper just went on didn't really say anything and we thought well that's really odd and so Topeka at that time had two other daily papers and so we got to looking in them and they had a lot to say about it because yeah, Woodrow Wilson wanted to come and talk to the Farmers Union, but the political bigwigs in Topeka had it all worked out with the municipal auditorium that when the farmers got up to leave for lunch, then they would be sat in on the seats in the municipal auditorium that the farmers had been occupying for the state convention. Well, the farmers caught word of that and so they all brought their lunch and nobody got up from their seats and so the paper was just full of pissed off politicians that had to stand outside while the president addressed the farmers union and i just love that story because it just shows their attitude from early on to today <clears throat> yeah now we're getting into these state presidents and we'll go over the top of them these were all wonderful Wonderful people is John Trumbull. He was they wanted him to run for governor. He didn't do it. Um, we had a lot of people early on, editors and so on and so forth. Actually, one did Lanston from Salina. He did run. He wasn't a president, but he was our lecturer and he ran for governor. Huff was pretty important. He was from North Kansas. He and he went on to be a national president of Farmers Union as well. And he got rolled out of that position basically, but he didn't walk away. He's one of those stickers, you know, no matter what, and went on to do wonderful things as with our insurance company. And, and then he served on as the president of Farmers National Grain Corporation. That was that before Farm Bill. So, yeah, he once again he was a preacher. Um, did a lot of different things. I've, I've talked to his grandson and I need to get back with him. And um, he's got some things I'd like to see and I've got some things he'd like to see, so. And Orinoke now is literally a ghost town. I mean, yeah. It's... Well, Norton is damn near too. That's in Norton County with all the COVID. Yeah. Cal Ward, um, president from the Lawrence area, the Lone Star part. Um, he went on to work uh, on in the AAA um, agency, and uh, but he was a wonderful, wonderful president that went on to work uh, in government. Um, this guy Vasecki, his farm's 18 miles from my place. Um, managed a local co-op farmer, and uh, he was president from 37 to 40, and then Jim Patton was president after him. So anyway, let's go on. Now, I've, I've talked to his relatives too. And here's an important part because, you know, we get back to Farmers Union and what, what makes it live so long. But we were such big cooperatives and we still are big cooperative operations and behind them. But, he, you know, he, he made that uh, statement that I believe our Farmers Union cooperatives will finally fall by the wayside unless we keep them up and protect the great Farmers Union itself. That had to do with board members and so on and so forth. Don't let you talk. This is your neck of the woods. Yeah. Uh, St. Mary's, uh, those buildings still stood till just a few years ago. And that they were demolished. But And the St. Mary's Farmers Union Co-op still exists there. Uh, but they, they marketed seed corn in six states. They had 1,400 acres under cultivation in the Caw River Valley. Tom tells a story. There's a Catholic monastery that was there at that time, and that the students would be assigned or hired to detassel. And yeah, I've, you know, I've got friends my age that that were high school kids down there and detasseled for them and stuff. Yeah, we actually we raised the corn and we marketed it. In fact, over, over my right shoulder, that seed sack, and you'll know, find Iowa had it too. There were, you need to mute. Um, anyway, yeah. yeah. Okay. Not Tom, you muted. 
You better unmute yourself, Tom. I don't want to finish this by myself. I didn't know I did. I think you. <laughs> hey, Don. In the yeah. Frank in the Frankfurt paper today, seventy-five years ago article, nineteen forty-five. It's got a history deal that north of Winifred, Kansas, the seed corn company from St. Mary's uh, commenced to pick up hybrid seed corn in this community Friday afternoon, and the seed is trucked to St. Mary's where it will be processed. And that was wow. 75 years ago, 1945. Cool. Send, me a, send that to me. I'll stick it in the slideshow. <laughs> okay. Don't really have a lot to say oh. about it, Ross. Excuse me. Are you trying to tell me we do need to, Tom? No, I, we need to go through. I just, <laughs> I, I never muted myself before I call. Sorry. <clears throat> and this is a part of a farmer's union history that I just haven't researched enough in, through the 1940s into the 50s. That's kind of a blank. And of course, after the yeah. 60s, I've lived it. So I can <laughs> yeah. talk. To that. There you go. So the Topeka Historical Society had all our records up to 1948. And then they don't. And so Actually, some banks are in Colorado after that. But... They don't have it on microfilm. And I've actually got back and they've dug around. We've got the papers from the 40s and 50s up there, but there are the physical papers, and those are hard to get your hands on, literally. Yeah. Okay. 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 We were showing this that night, and Jim Ploger goes, yeah, I worked in that one office. He worked for Kansas Farmers Union when he started out. Martin Byrne came from North Dakota. Um, he was an organizer up there. He came down and it, that didn't turn out real well. <clears throat> but I don't know the whole story. He got arrested in Rush County for selling securities without a license. Of course, Barrett got arrested here too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Bill Daniels was an interim president when we lost our charter. His wife just passed away a few weeks ago out in Garden City or Cimarron. Bill, I knew Bill really well. He was a wonderful gentleman. We lost our charter then and uh, got it back in 74. That's when I got active. So uh, one of our newer members asked us what happened that we lost our charter. That's when our insurance company walked away from us. And uh, that happened to most of the Midwest states, Nebraska, Missouri, Illinois, Indiana, Ohio. And, you know, some of the states managed to hold on to theirs. And they're the North Dakota, South Dakota, Montana, Minnesota, Rocky, that are so successful today. The difference is what happened in 1967. And so, yeah, that, I, 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 that was before my time. <laughs> I've made my share of screw ups, but that was an interesting time in farmers union history. And when I was down at the Oklahoma State Convention and George's funeral later on, they, I think Oklahoma lost their insurance company too during that time. And George Stone built it back up again. Yeah. And so he always called it his insurance company. So he would always ask him, you guys taking care of my insurance company? Yeah, same <clears throat> just like George. Every no state farmers, over the years, every state farmers union has lost their charter and has been reissued. I can't think of a single instance of a, now they, they never, the organization they may not have died. They just didn't work chartered. They didn't work at charter string. <clears throat> Dale Lyon was elected in 73. He's from up in Smith County. He's still with us. Yep. Dale, 
Dale and Don are only two living presidents for Kansas at, around anymore. Dale was just brilliant. Uh, he come up with more good ideas and stuff by accident. He had a weekly radio program on every Sunday morning uh, that aired across the state on different stations. Uh, he was very good in the legislature. He was good on the national board. Um, just a wonderful gentleman. And of course, some of you remember Ivan, and he was president till 2000. <clears throat> and Ivan's passed away since. That says longest serving. Well, Don's passed him up now. Yeah, I'll give. I'll let him keep that title. I had a lot less gray hair then. Yep. State office in McPherson, 74 to present, still is. We don't have that building now. Um, state office moved around a lot. It was in Salina for many, many years, Topeka, back and forth. Actually, it was in St. Mary's for a short period, like a year or two. Mm -hmm. now, and um, so, yeah, national presidents, let's go on to that, from, from Kansas. Jim Patton was born in, in Kansas, in Chase County, but went on to Rocky Mountain or Colorado Farmers Union. He was national president from 1940 to 66. This man brought us into a whole new era of agriculture and a whole new uh, level of consciousness about where we were globally, but yet where people could hang on to their, their roots and their communities. Probably, and I've had the pleasure to meet the guy, but probably the most, I don't know. I, I mean, Barrett was really important in early days, but I think Patton, maybe hands down was it. Tony Deshaunt from, he followed Patton from 60 to 88 or to 80, up from Hayes, Kansas, Ellis County, Munger. Just a wonderful human being. Yeah, okay. Worthless trivia, he wasn't French, he was German and that wasn't Tony Deshaunt, it was Tony Deckett. Deckett, yeah. <laughs> and um, he, a lot of his memoirs, I got a lot of his stuff, he talked about as a kid, the how they were really heckled when they rent, went to school because they spoke German, um, really, really got chest or, you know, put down for it. So let's go on. But these four people who were from Kansas, three of them were Kansas presidents that went on to be, <clears throat> when no, I did shot was just Desecki and Huff. But at that time, over half the years of National Farmers Union was led by a Kansan or someone with Kansan roots, Kansas roots. So Tom and I put this together and just added this to it. Uh, but it kind of is a little bit of a timeline of some of our success stories through it. Uh, some of them are something to really be proud yeah. of. We've always been really progressive, you know, U.S. senators weren't elected by popular vote until the 17th Amendment, and we pushed for that. 1916, Federal Farm Loan Act established federal and bank loans. The first one made in the United States of America is about five miles from my house here at Launard. Um, we always, for women's suffrage um, and women's right to vote, which 1916, but it's finally become universal in 1919. Um, Packers and Stockyards Act, we advocated for that early on. The Capra Volstead, that's why how co-ops can exist and legally, we were fully behind that. Allow, you know, that that led to the great explosive growth in cooperatives in the United States. Grain Futures Act put a lot of restrictions on the futures trading. Twenty-four McNary Hagen Act, that was the first farm bill which passed Congress but was vetoed. And um, but it was really vetoed that both times, yeah. And uh, but it laid the groundwork for the AAA program. And you know, the AAA program was actually declared unconstitutional, I think, in 1937 or 38. And they came back to make it constitutionally correct. They tied you got paid for con they tied conservation to it, and that's why to this day all farm programs have a conservation tie to it because of that Supreme Court ruling. Um, parity, of course, that goes back to 1910, 1914. Very, very important. Uh, 
we're one of the few people that still use that in our lexicon. I mean, it's we and it's real. So we have this long history early on. And since then, we've done, you know, we go on, I guess. Um, you know, and, and when the AAA program came in, farmer, local farmer county committees had a lot of power. They actually set the loan rate for grain. Now they have grammars they had to be in, but they administered all farm programs. Uh, you know, we, Farmers Union had a little bit of a split on the New Deal legislation, and that was, that's another story for another day, but we fought for the farm programs you always have. 1934, we were key in getting the Rural Electrification Administration passed. It passed in 36, but that was huge. And in Wisconsin, um, oh, Robert Lewis, his dad, Farmers Union guy was instrumental in getting that done. And Robert Lewis worked for us. He was, and he's still around too. He's over a hundred years old. Um, the Commodity Exchange Act we fought for, that was a big one in 36. N school lunches came right out of Farmers Union and that was our proposal. And we worked on that. Um, rural cooperatives or rural telephone co-ops. Um, Social Security has been one of our things. Uh, to get farmers in initially, they weren't. Um, we supported development of the first international wheat agreement. These were bilateral agreements, not the multilateral uh, agreements. Um, School Milk Act, we fought for that and got it passed in 54. Got another page, Don, or is that it? Yeah. Food for Peace program, Public Law 480 is huge. That was a big market developer and fed the hungry after the war. Um, you know, George McGovern talks about that when we came to our conventions. I mean, he's deceased, but, but he worked with, with Bob Dole and worked with Jim Patton and, and all these people. Uh, in the early 1960s, this is a fun story. Jim Patton, our national president, was in the White House and with a group of people and urged LBJ to declare war on poverty. And LBJ took that term got up and within 10 minutes went out and had a press conference. And that was the LBJ's war on poverty. That came right out of Farmers Union, Jim Patton's mouth. Um, the Green Thumb Program employment for older Americans was ours, 1965. The fly-in was developed in 1965. We were doing a lot of legislative stuff, but used to take buses or trains, but we actually organized fly in starting in 1965. Uh, ladies fly in, um, uh, you know, we've, we've fought Nixon, you know, we had a farmer's union had an airplane, a big airplane that we'd fly people in for fly-ins and interstate, um, membership drives. But so wasn't that North Dakota's plane? No, they had one too, but ours is bigger, but, yeah. but, uh, they had a plane too that they flew around, but that, but, um, this whole Nixon thing. He despised Farmers Union so bad. I asked one time, I asked Mel Borton, who was one of our organizers, still around, why we got rid of that. And he said, well, he said, Nixon was so ticked off at us that he kept having the FAA ground our plane in for inspections, and we just couldn't get it up in the air. So that's the reason we got out of the, that plane business. We were active in supporting civil rights, well, very early on, especially from the 40s onward. There's a whole story in the South that we got reinvolved with the Louisiana Farmers Union. And that's another story for another day. Of course, we've always been an advocate for the Postal Service, which is another front line, front burner issue now. And this is just a small slice of it. Farmers Union's had this long history, you know, 120 years, basically. That's a long time for longevity of an organization. Hey, Tom. Yes. Could you go into a little bit more detail on that uh, deal with Nixon wanting to drop USDA from cabinet level agency. That's the first I've ever heard of that. Yeah, and I, I guess I'm not well versed. I know that he was, he was working on that. And um, yeah, you know, we've got to blend it into four other non ag agencies. Yeah, yeah just split it up, divide and conquer, you know, the old thing. Right. And, uh, so yeah, I mean, just like you know, the Postal Service used to be a cabinet level thing, too. And that got, I don't know who was in charge when that got out of the cabinet level. 
but that's how you, you know, sometimes the way you tear thing, you can be more effective tearing things down than just trying to stop something, just weaken them. And that's, that's what farmers union has always been there. We've always rattled our sabers and said, no, you're not going to do that to us. And we still, that, do sounds, that. that sounds pretty familiar today, doesn't it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we still do it. And we've got wonderful membership. We've got that, that just runs in our blood as an organization. And I mean, that's what attracts people to farmers union. One of the many things. So that last quote was by Ralph Snyder, the first president of Kansas Farm Bureau. Yeah. And yeah. So I always, in some of my other talks with this slide and Don put it together, why Farmers Union endures? How, why, how can it be nearly 120 years? I mean, we've seen us go from farmer with horses and mules to computers, I mean, and everything in between. We've seen all these things happen. And you know, what I like to say is, you know, look at the things that change and the things that, that don't change. The things that don't change are the issues. I mean, we've consolidation, monopolies, all of these, you go right, everything we're fighting today, we were fighting 100, 120 years ago. And the, the things that do change are one is the date on the calendar, and the other is the resolve of people to make a difference. But Farmers Union has done this, we, there's this golden thread that runs through Farmers Union that connects us all. And I kind of end my talks with this, with this slide and why we endure. And it is because Farmers Union is just loaded with progressive forward thinking individuals that have the ability to come together and read, you know, the old saying, come let us reason together, fits us so perfectly. We value education. And I'm not talking about just youth camps and education talking about cooperative education or co-ops we that's why we were instrumental in a lot of the co-ops of having a certain percentage of the profits set back for education because Gladys Talbot Edwards even Charlie Talbot from North Dakota would say if you don't keep people educated about why we have a cooperative he said it won't be many years and that cooperative will disappear I think our membership is is um is really intellectually curious we, we, we ask the right questions. We're not afraid to, to ask the questions and bring up the points. And then we're a diverse general farm organization, which sets us aside from commodity organizations. I mean, they serve a purpose, yes, but, but I like to say that Farmers Union represents people. A lot of these commodity organizations represent the commodity itself, like wheat, corn, but we represent the heart and soul of who we are and the people. And, you know, we're just in general we're bigger than just our farms we understand that as as individuals but we come together as an organization we have leadership at all levels on the local national state and leadership i think we've defined it in a different way it isn't who's elected president leadership i say comes from behind comes from inside comes comes from all different levels and all different places our activities are decentralized. We are not a top-down organization. Tony Deschamps always showed, you know, how we have our Farmers Union Triangle and someone say, well, the members and then the county organization, state organization, national. He'd flip that under, over and he'd say, okay, at the top is the members. And it was like, and he showed the grassroots thing. And then it went down from there. And he showed the national president as being on the bottom, not on the top. And that's why our leadership is so successful is because it trickle, it permeates downward into a deeper, deeper cause and a different, different, or deeper actions. Um, we have this wonderful collective consciousness. I mean, that's what you get, not just in meetings like this, but even our, our, our conventions. And I think that's why we're all kind of aching and hurting a little bit that we're not going to meet because because that's what happens at conventions, you know, at face to face thing. But, but you know, unfortunately, we just can't do it right now. Um, John or uh, McAuliffe, our early president, uh, Morris, he made that comment about the 1918 thing. He said, well, he said, we just got to get through it. He called it back then. It was a pesky thing. He said, because it does us no good if we're stowed in the great beyond. That, if, you know, in other words, if we die, it does no, nobody any good. So it's something we have to do. 
and kind of wrap this thing up, you know, I think Farmers Union is so visionary. It's just incredible. When you when you're around these other people, it just it just breathes on itself. And other people, we we pull out from each other the best and we make it better. And we're inclusive. We we aren't we aren't an exclusive organization. We include not only our members, but our communities. We include our farms, we include what we're all about. And our impacts go way beyond our farms. So that's that's the farmers union of the past, present, and future. Right there, what you're seeing on that screen. I'll stop with that. You know, and I I might also add that who knows what the election's gonna turn out like next week, but uh, a lot of the times farmers unions associated with the Democratic Party. Well, if we have a new administration and and uh, Democrats take the Senate, farmers unions are going to be in a position to really make a difference in agriculture through this next administration if that happens. And so our involvement at the local level and the state level can make a lot of difference on up the food chain if those conditions develop like they might. So, yep. Well, Don, do we have any questions or that we, or do we have time for any of that or, or are we done? I'm willing to sit here and talk all night if I can crack open the bourbon bottle. Uh, we were scheduled for 7 to 8.30 and we got 10 minutes left. So I'm sure happy to have a discussion. We could probably learn a lot. Hey guys. Uh, you want to talk about, since you mentioned uh, new administration, talk about John Simpson, uh, who was national president and the promises that were made to him. Yeah, and that's that's probably a great example of, of the perils of how, how touchy that can be. John Simpson, well, when FDR was running for president, John Simpson thought that FDR <clears throat> promised him the Secretary of Agriculture position. And by the way, there's never been a Farmers Union President Secretary of Agriculture. There's Farmers Union Presidents that wanted to be Secretary and never got it. And there's people it was offered to and never got it. I think, I think um, Barrett was offered from six different administrations to be, but, but anyway, he thought um, that FDR promised him Secretary of Job. Well, one of the first farm meetings group that grouped up in the White House of, of farm organizations. Um, anyway, John Simpson, our national president, was there, and when <clears throat> when um, FDR announced that Henry Wallace was going to be his secretary, Simpson just lost it, and just he he was really really heated, and uh, it it was almost embarrassing, but that caused a split within the organization and it really made it difficult for farmers union to come into the whole AAA program and so on and so forth. Simpson is really powerful. He actually was one of the few, his name was on a piece of legislation, which was probably the only legislation that had a, somebody's name on it that wasn't actually a congressman. And he died on the steps of the, another side story, on the steps of the Capitol, on the U.S. Capitol, after he had testified at two different hearings that particular day, and he was walking out with somebody from the Grange and somebody from the Farm Bureau. One of them was the president and the other one was um, secretary or, or whatever the organization. He collapsed with a heart attack, and one of those guys draped him in his arms on the steps of the Capitol while the other ran and got some water, and it was, a, I guess, a real, quite a, I mean, to me, it was quite an interesting scene that there you had Farmers Union, Farm Bureau and Grange that were actually together and were, you know, at a time of crisis. But, but anyway, John Simpson was a very, very powerful uh, farm leader in, in Farmers Union. He was born in Nebraska, went to school, got his law degree from the University of Kansas, he actually farmed northeast of Beloit about six miles. I know I got an exact location of his farm, but very fiery, very opinionated. But he was one that thought he had the Secretary of Agriculture's job and he didn't get it. And 
a person his personal uh, feelings about that really set our organization back in that in that time period for a few years until we got our feet back on the ground and we got a guy from south dakota come in and be he was a vice president at everson and uh for a few years and then then we went to Vasecki and anyway there's that's a whole other story but i don't know if i answered what you want to hear next but yeah yeah. No, that's perfect. That that's exactly what I was thinking. And he's yeah. really uh, wasn't he the one that wrote the militant farm organization book? Yeah, yeah. He I mean he's brilliant. We we've had we've had so many brilliant leaders. We had so many brilliant members, and uh, just I mean it's just a who's who in agriculture. So you I've know? I've been struggling around trying to come up with this slide, but in 1932. Farmers Union, Farm Bureau, and the Grange met and agreed upon the general features of a parity price yardstick, production controls, and processing taxes, and that's was the basis of what started the AAA program. So yeah. it was working together across yeah. the organizations that made that work. Yeah. Anybody else? You could tell Tom and I like talking about this stuff. Hmm. Yeah. Well, I've got a whole series of slideshows. I got a lot more research to do, but I'm just going to tell you um, probably the best thing that in my life is when I started researching this more and learning more about who we are. And I try to share that with as many people as possible. And, uh, there was a little bit of discussion of why I call amateur, and there, there's a real serious reason for it because Roger Johnson wanted to call me honorary, and honorary means you know, work for no money, which that's what I do, obviously. But but honorary also indicates that you are a trained historian with a degree, and I do not have a degree in history. My degree is in geology, so I I was told by a, a person that the correct label would be amateur historian. Maybe if I get out of this farming thing in time, maybe I'll go back and get a history degree. You got a good start. There you go. So one thing that struck me as I was putting together these last slides is we really do a good job of kind of documenting things up to 1971. But after that, we've done a lot of good things too, but it's not in this history presentation. And so you know, the next generation or the next effort should be to modernize this slideshow presentation to bring it up to modern times. And I'll take the blame for that, but yeah, it's one of the facts, like I'm gonna be 68 here in a few days. And this, I lived through that, so it, it doesn't seem, I mean, I know it, but people like on our board, young, good, good young people need to know too, we, yeah, think, yeah. think how hard we had to hunt to find what we did to put yeah. this together. And yeah. so, this yeah. is uh, Ed Resna check. While there's still living memory around, those people should get together and you could do something like what you've got on the screen right now, just identify key dates and key events. Um, you know, there's, I mean, there's still a good part of that living memory here and and should take advantage of it. I've got copies of the Washington newsletter from about where this picks up. And I've got other documents too, but golly, I just need to stop and do that. But I could go through those Washington newsletters and pick it all up. Cause that was a weekly publication for many years. And Tom, and this are, is Nick. Yeah. Tom, this is Nick. I think I speak for everybody when I say it's time you wrote the National Farmers Union history book. Well, thank you. And I'd, I'd like to do that. And I'm getting I'm getting there. Um, I just need to get out of this farming business, which I'm working on pretty hard. I've come a long way, but I got a ways to go. What I really like to do is travel the country and do oral interviews with these people my age or older. And uh, that's a great way to capture some of this. 
Well, I think there's a lot of us here tonight that would be glad to help you in any way we can, because I, I think capturing this history for posterity, we've got to do it. Yeah. Yeah, we hope we hope we didn't bore you too much tonight. But this was kind of fun for us. Thank you all. The uh, back in next Thursday.